Arthur Witten, United States Army, Vietnam. I had the pleasure and opportunity to interview Art when I was in Mountain View, California 17 years ago. It was April 25th, 2006. Art was 21 years old when he went to Vietnam as a W-1, a Warrant Officer 1. He later became a CW-2, which is a Chief Warrant Officer 2. He's one of my dust-off pilots, folks. If you know what a dust-off pilot was or is, a medevac pilot. And so many of the troops have said they have so much respect for these medevac pilots because they did so much and they, they really are unsung heroes. Art went to Vietnam in 1968, served with the 45th Medical Battalion, which is part of the 44th Medical Brigade, helicopter ambulances. And uh, he just tells a great, great story. Stephen Russo, God bless you. I wanna thank you, Stephen. Look into this camera and say thank you for waiting for this interview and for sponsoring Art's story and making it possible for all these people to learn more about Vietnam through the eyes and the ears of Art Witten. So thank you, Stephen, I salute you. All right, folks, I, I'd like to encourage you, if you've been touched by these stories, and I know thousands of you have, if you've been blessed by these stories, pay it forward. You know, I'm gonna ask you to donate to this work. And by doing so, you're gonna allow me to continue doing my work of interviewing more veterans this year, Vietnam veterans, of continuing to bring you more stories on the Voices of History uh, YouTube channel here and also my radio station now Voices of History Radio. So when you donate to my work the, the money goes towards that. I don't run any commercials folks. I hope you can appreciate that. It's gonna take a moment here, okay? I, I hope you appreciate the fact I am not monetizing these videos like so many of the YouTube videos. You turn them on and and these stupid commercials just interrupt the program. So I don't do that and I, I this is totally listener supported, okay? So I'm not going to talk about sponsoring a veteran story right now. I'm going to talk about donating to this work. If it's pulling on your heart, I'm not asking for a million dollars, folks. If you want to help me to continue this work, I would appreciate it. Uh, there's, a, there's a link. When you go to comment on the video, there's a link at the top of the comments. It's, it's a link that I put in there. You can click on that and, and just make a donation. It's really simple. If you don't like that, you can email me and decide another way to do that. Uh, my email address is on my website, LarryCapetto.com. It's in the email, excuse me, it's in the video descriptions of this video. And so I just take a moment to pause and I want to thank all of those people out there that have donated and have sponsored these stories. It's, it's greatly appreciated. I don't take it lightly and I really thank you. I pray for you. I thank God for you. And I want to keep, keep this work going, folks. So Art Witten's story, I know many of you are going to be touched, blessed, moved like I was when I heard it again. And Art, God bless you. He was 59 years old when I interviewed him. Today he's about 77, so they're getting older, folks. The Vietnam veterans t today are almost the same age as the, Viet as the World War II veterans were when I started my work 20 years ago. So think about that. There's an urgency about getting these stories. Okay, my ranks are growing thin. God bless you. Thank you for subscribing to this channel and sharing these videos. And uh, I just am grateful for, for all these veterans that I've met over the years, and my heart's full. So. Enjoy Art's story. God bless you. Think a little bit about some of the answers because <clears throat> I've really never sat down and told anybody about 
all the different experiences except at uh, small social gatherings. Or well, that's why I'm so glad you're here. Okay. I really am. Thank you, sir, for coming. Yeah, um, that's right. Um, let's just start. Um, we've got about 45 minutes, but I'd like sure. to just tell me uh, the Army unit you're with, if there's a division, battalion, your rank at the time of Vietnam. Okay. Just give me that information. Uh, I was a 21-year-old uh, W-1 foreign officer when I arrived in Vietnam, July of 68, and I was assigned to the 45th uh, Medical Company Helicopter Ambulance under the 44th Med Brigade. We were normally uh, located right next to a hospital. In this case, it was the 93rd Evac Hospital. Uh, about four months into my tour, I was promoted to CW-2, and then the could call us chief, made us feel a lot older. And uh, in December of 68, uh, I was uh, transferred into a new medical helicopter ambulance detachment that came in country to give them some experience. And then we were assigned to Dong Tam in uh, four corps and uh, in support of the 9th Infantry Division. Okay. We used to do that assignment single ship out of uh, Long Bend up in three corps near Saigon. Say 45th Medical <coughs> Company. Company, okay. Uh, helicopter ambulance. Okay. And correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't today's emergency medical services, isn't that really pattern off a lot of what we saw in Vietnam as far Absolutely. as responding? Absolutely. Especially the helicopter flights that all the hospitals have these mm -hmm. things. The same situation occurs. Absolutely. Um, there were uh, men in my second unit, uh, one was a captain, our maintenance officer, that even talked about setting up a civilian medevac when he got back from the, uh, the war in Vietnam. So it is, and, and they run very similar to us except for the hostility, so <laughs> in most sure. cases. All right, so. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, Art, there's so much I can ask you, and I know there's a lot that we can talk about, but um, so forgive me if I jump around a little bit. Sure. Just can you, was this your first time in combat or around combat when you went to Vietnam? Tell me about when you arrived in Vietnam, what you felt, if you remember your, first, your arrival, I mean, was it mm -hmm. what you thought it was, you know, did you enlist, were you drafted, or just... Right. Uh, for a little history, my father was a World War II B-17 pilot, and for all my youth that I can remember, I wanted to be a pilot. And when I was in college at the University of Miami, in my second year, I was uh, disenchanted with architecture. So I went to the Air Force and Navy both to see if I could enlist as a two-year college individual. They had an AVCAD program. Uh, they, I was told by both uh, the Air Force and the Navy they had terminated that, but the Army was taking pilot uh, applications. So I went to the Army and they had helicopter warrant officer. <coughs> so I enlisted for that and uh, went through basic and advanced helicopter training. After that, um, why, I'm not sure. We were uh, with a Witten as the last name, I'm on the bottom of the alphabet, and the last 20 of us were selected to go to AMEDS or uh, Air Medical Training for Aviators to be dust off pilots. So we went to Fort Sam Houston for a month and became surgeons with our one hand while we flew with the other, doing uh, surgery on goats and things like that, just to have an idea of what the medic in the back of the helicopter might be going through while we were flying, and also that we would understand what he was telling us so we could. Uh, forward that information to the hospital as we were bringing the wounded inbound. After that, uh, we were assigned to, to Vietnam. Um, I really don't have any uh, remembrance of any trepidation, anxiety, or anything like that about going to Vietnam. Uh, almost excitement. Uh, wanted to get to fly. Uh, my father, like I said, had been in combat as a pilot. Um, he his only advice to me the day I left was, uh, no matter what happens, don't give up. That was good advice. There were several times that uh, uh, either in flying or uh, having crashed and shot down a couple times <coughs> that giving up would have been easy, uh, but uh, the advice stuck and uh, got me through. Arriving in Vietnam, uh, July 68, was hot, muggy. Uh, we were put in a placement company. There were numerous medevac units throughout the country at that time. And uh, for whatever reason, we, uh, there's three of us. Uh, we were assigned to the 45th Med Company right there in Long Bend, where the replacement company was. I went through the normal uh, indoctrination. Here's your room. Here's your roommate. 
uh, my roommate happened to be the, one of the platoon leaders, the platoon that I was in, uh, Captain Truscott, and somewhat my mentor. I flew with him a lot, learned uh, his skills, and uh, adapted those into my own flying techniques for the combat side of the job. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> normally we had uh, several ships on standby, first up, second up, and third uh, aircraft was hospital, hospital transfers and that type of thing. And usually you flew a couple trips on the hospital to hospital ship to learn where the medevac pads were, the hospital pads, before they started putting you into the uh, first and second up, which were the combat uh, missions that came in. Um, do, do me a favor mm -hmm. now. Your information is great. I love mm -hmm. what you're saying. Can you can you walk me through a a, a combat mission of sorts of you know getting on mm -hmm. going if you're taking troops as you go into a, I know we're going to bounce around a little bit but then as, as you're in route and sure. just anything you want to remember or tell me about you know incoming fire the, the you know anything anybody the crew on the aircraft um, mm -hmm. I'm gonna probably want to know where they're positioned the gunners and all that and then sure. as you go in and out of hot LZs just let's just start okay. giving some stories here let me just. Uh pick a mission that had a little bit of uh, all the things you're asking for. Uh, the enemy could be found very close to wherever you came out of, even Long Bend. You didn't have to go very many miles. Um, let me just pick one out of, uh, out of Dong Tam. <coughs> um, crew consisted of four, pilot and aircraft commander. The aircraft commander usually sat in the left seat, better view. We had a medic and a crew chief. They both sat right behind us on uh, armor plates on the floor and they had seat belts. Whether they wore them all the time, I, I seriously doubt it. We were encased in an armored seat, although our shoulders and heads stuck above it, and our th from mid-thigh out, our legs were exposed, and our forearms. We also wore what we referred to as a chicken plate in front of us. It had a little pouch on the front for pens, pencils, grease pencils. We usually wrote on the windshield of the aircraft with coordinates and frequencies. Excuse me. Uh, we would be standing uh, somewhere around operations in the morning, waiting for a call to come in. The call would get relayed through the 9th Division TOC, Tactical Operations Center, and forwarded down to our operations where our RTO, or radio transmit operator, would copy down the name of the unit, their call sign frequency, and their coordinates. Uh, as soon as we got a call, we had a mission come in, the uh, medic and crew chief and pilot would go out to the airplane and get it running, get it up to speed for us. A aircraft commander would take the mission sheet, look at it, plot it on the map, see the best route to get to there, <clears throat> and then join the rest of the crew at the aircraft. Uh, and then as we'd take off, depending on how far the uh, pickup was, either right outside the berm in many cases, or just a few clicks in 15, 20 minute flight from the, uh, the compound, uh, we would brief the rest of the crew en route. Uh, there were standard briefings <coughs> that we gave all the new crew members and whatnot is how to handle ourselves once we got into the LZ, so we didn't have to do that each time. And those consisted on calls to let the medic and crew chief know that one, it's either getting way too hot up here, there's too many rounds coming into the airplane, we need to leave now, we'll come back uh, as soon as we can. And that was get on, get on, get on. After the third get on call, we were leaving with or without them. And they would become infantrymen if they weren't on board, but <coughs> they always seemed to get on board. Uh, if they were working the, uh, uh, loading the patients and uh, we didn't have an urgency to leave, in other words, we weren't scared yet that the rounds were getting too close. Uh, once they got everybody loaded, which could consist of three litters stacked and two ambulatory on each side of what we referred to as the hell hole or the transmission casing in the Huey, they would say, go, 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 and on the third go, we'd go. Uh, anyway, en route out to the uh, LZ. Uh, normally, we did all our communications with the combat units on FM radio. That's what they carried on their backs. And uh, once we uh, figured we were in a oh, range, a couple clicks out, we'd start calling the call sign that they gave us. And then we'd also start monitoring. If they were purely a uh, ground unit <coughs> in combat, that one frequency was good enough. If they were working with gunships or other type of uh, support, uh, the C-47 type of uh, aerial weapons platform, we would try to get their frequency also. <clears throat> we were basically the only single ship unarmed combat mission going. We didn't take gunships with us. If they were there, we would try to use them. 
uh, for cover, but uh, most times we were by ourselves, uh, unarmed. We had no external guns. It was just our own personal weapons for protection uh, if we ended up on the ground. Once we got in contact with the uh, ground unit, uh, we'd tell them we were inbound. And trying to figure out which way the Huey's coming, what direction it's coming from on the ground as a ground pounder, you couldn't tell. The sound just seemed to evolve all around you. So we would give them a, a direction we thought we were coming from and ask them to, in the daytime, pop smoke. At nighttime, uh, we'd ask them to put out a light, and they'd either use strobe lights or a flare, depending on their combat situation. During the daytime, if they popped smoke, we'd identify the color. It was not unusual in uh, large um, combat situations to have more than one smoke go out. Either the friendlies would do that to confuse Charlie as to where the helicopter was going to land, or Charlie would throw out smoke trying to lure us in, and that occasionally happened. Um, after we identified the smoke, we would uh, basically assess the route in and out based on the combat situation as we knew it from the ground units. <coughs> and uh, we didn't make just a nice uh, casual approach into any LZs. Uh, it may not have been declared a hot LZ, but regardless, uh, we just assumed the bad guys were there. So uh, medevac pilots uh, pretty much all use the same approach. We would basically bend the helicopter over on its side and put the collective down and basically dive it straight down, sometimes maybe turning a little bit just to maneuver get down to within 50 feet of the ground, level off, and then come into the LZ high speed, somewhere around 90 to 100 knots, high speed for helicopters. Uh, getting real close to the LZ, we'd put it in a uh, flare, deceleration flare, and uh, depending on who was flying, uh, myself, the aircraft commander on the left, or the pilot on the right, uh, normally that side would be to where the patients were, uh, regardless of where the bad guys were. We didn't uh, play favorites that way. It'd be easy to stick the other guy on the, <laughs> on the bad side of the aircraft. Uh, so as soon as we'd, uh, the skids would touch, the crew chief and medic uh, would jump out. They'd start loading uh, litters first. The top litter would go on first and so on down for a total of three. The third one would sit on the floor. If there were ambulatory patients, those that could walk, uh, they were assisted either by the ground units or the medic or crew chief on their side of the aircraft to get in uh, to the uh, two seats along the transmission well. We tried to buckle them in, but a lot of times we didn't have the time. As soon as they were on, uh, they'd sit down, pull the door strap to pull the door shut, yell, go, 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 and then we'd uh, pull pitch. Getting out of the LZ just depends on what happened in the LZ. We'd either go out uh, in a similar direction that we came in. That's not a good idea all the time because you don't know what uh, bad guys were doing as you pass by. Uh, sometimes uh, if we were up next to a tree line and uh, we would see firing going off in one direction or another, we'd pull straight up to top the trees and then lay it over and depart along the treetops. I've had both situations where both <coughs> didn't work out very well. Uh, coming out similar direction we came in one time, we didn't receive any fire in the LZ, but on the way out we took numerous uh, rounds and one of them knocked out our hydraulics. And normally uh, any helicopter you can fly with uh, a real light touch between your fingers, but once the hydraulics go out, it takes 70 to 100 pounds of pressure to move the control, and it's very stiff with feedback. So uh, we were coming out, and this particular one, the sad uh, thing is to, you can hear the AK rounds hitting through the uh, skin of the Huey, uh, and this particular mission, putting it together for you, um, as the round struck the aircraft, one of them re-wounded one of the soldiers laying on a, on a litter and uh, his scream from being re-wounded, uh, you could hear it without any kind of interphone necessary. It was really uh, kind of disturbing but, and sad. Uh, but anyway, the aircraft w had no hydraulics. Fortunately, we were only uh, five clicks out of the base camp. And under those situations, you land it like an airplane. You have to make a run-on landing type of thing. And we, of course, called the tower and told them we were coming in without hydraulics. And they rolled the crash crews. And we told them we had, uh, we are medevac, we had uh, wounded on board and needed the hospital to send the ambulance out. So as it all turns out, uh, the airplane or the helicopter uh, landed fine. Uh, we got the patients out and then we go back and see what's next mission standing by for us. Sometimes if we were working a unit, we would just turn around and go right back out because they probably have more wounded or said they did. So now you're, a, you're a helicopter pilot, but you've got medical training. <coughs> uh, limited medical were training. Were there situations where you had to assist with the wounded or did they? No, not while we're flying. Basically that knowledge was so if the medic said, 
Uh, you know, we got uh, one laying here with both of the legs blown off. Uh, we could kind of pass that information with a little bit of knowledge to the uh, hospital as we were inbound. The only time we ever got to actually, and we didn't practice medicine by any means, we're not near doctors, uh, but on days that uh, we weren't uh, scheduled to fly to a later mission, we'd actually go into triage and help. Uh, there was really nothing else to do, so as our other ships would come in, the other crews, and bring in wounded, uh, we'd either help carry the litters in or help the doctors. I've literally held a man's leg while the doctor severed what little bit of skin was holding it on. And uh, I've seen miraculous uh, things in the emergency room, splitting chests and massaging hearts right there. Uh, the whole crews, uh, all the medevac crews, the crew chiefs and the medics would cross-train each other so they could help each other either do maintenance on the aircraft or do maintenance on the, the wounded. Uh, we had young medics that could uh, put an IV into a guy's arm that was covered in blood and mud and you just couldn't see any skin and just get those IVs in and save their lives, amazingly. Amazing work. Are there stories, Art, that are more vivid in your minds than others as far as the wounded? I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, did it ever get routine? Was it like, okay, here we go again? Or, I mean, you're a compassionate fella? I mean, did you pray for these guys? I mean, how, how <laughs> I mean, kind of just give me... You know, just tell me a little bit about the actual evacuation of the wounded. If there's, you mm -hmm. know, you, I think you mentioned in your email maybe some of the wounded were being shot again as they got mm -hmm. into the helicopters. And was it one of these dramatic Hollywood type scenes? Or was <laughs> it, I mean, you know. Yeah. Uh, I've I heard uh, stories of blood running out of the Hueys. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Not that I'm after the blood. Sure. I'm just saying. I understand. Yeah, there, there was uh, smells and sights in my mind's eye that I can still smell and uh, see today from. Uh, the horrors of war, if you will. Uh, we'd go out to uh, a site to pick up some soldiers that had probably been trying to disarm a booby trap. In this case, it was a 105 howitzer round that the VC had uh, put on a road roadside, very much like today's uh, EIDs. <coughs> and it had gone off. And when we get out there to medevac those that were wounded, one of the soldiers was laying face down long side of the road, just outside my window. And uh, they were loading the, uh, the wounded that could walk, mostly just shrapnel wounds. And uh, so I was yelling to the uh, crew chief that was sitting on my side, what about him? I was pointing out the window. And uh, he went over and asked the guy, and I could tell by his signal that the guy was dead. And we normally didn't take out dead the uh, slicks that troop carriers would come in later with the body bags and carry those out. Uh, but in this case, we had room. So they rolled him over and uh, there was no face. Everything had just been, it was just the back of his head that was there, kind of like a coconut shell. And just, was, you know, those things are shocking at the moment, uh, but after you see those kind of things, uh, legs and arms had been blown off with just stumps. Uh, after a while, you get hardened to the sight, but the compassion is there. And we'd bring these uh, guys back to the triage, and uh, next day, if we had time, we'd go into the uh, intensive care unit in the hospital and walk around and, and try to see where these guys were and how they were doing. Uh, I, I recall one young soldier with both legs gone asking for a cigarette, kind of sitting up on his elbows, probably not realizing his legs were gone or in shock, certainly. And uh, one of the crew members handed him a cigarette, waving at us, thanking us for coming in and getting him. And uh, next day, I believe, I walked through the eye, uh, intensive care unit and I saw him there. And of course, his legs, he was all bandaged up and stuff, and he basically was just, you know, there, but almost comatose. And, uh, you know, it, it's sad to see what they go through. Uh, How old are you now? I'll be 60 in September, thank you for asking. How old were you? Uh, I was 21 years old. Okay, so you said 21. So, yep. I mean, again, you know, after talking to all these World War II guys and mm -hmm. just 18, 19 years old landing on the beaches, the Germans, the Japanese, the, the, the things that happened, and then progressing into Korea and Vietnam. It's mm -hmm. just, you know, I think you said a war, war is hell. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just the, some of the same things you're he telling me, uh, you know, it's just amazing to me that somebody like yourself can be trained, go to a situation like that, and come back home and, and go on with your life. And I know a lot of the Vietnam vets have struggled with a lot of things, but, um, you know, the medevac part of what you're telling me. Now, in mm -hmm. your email, you said you flew like 1,050 hours, 3,000 right. wounded. Some of them were VC. Uh, I mean, so uh, 
you know what what you're describing is is horrific. I mean, the, the mm -hmm. scenes and what you saw and maybe what you've forgotten because they were so t terrible. But w what was the most difficult part of your job doing the medevacs? I mean, was there something that was mo more difficult than others as far as what you had to encounter and do and see? Um, the things that uh, probably were most uh, difficult to deal with was uh, maybe our own crew members. Um, let me start off with saying that <coughs> the uh, medevac crews were um, amazing people, not just for myself, I'm talking the whole uh, medics, crew chiefs, and pilots alike. Um, maybe best to describe it, the Latin underneath our unit crest said, uh, excuse my Latin, ut ali vivant, so others may live. And that's basically it. Uh, we flew day, night, single ship, unarmed, combat missions, rain, didn't matter. Uh, we'd go out there. Um, we'd been working one particular location all day long, and then at nighttime it came and it rained. Uh, we had flown there enough times we knew that if we flew a certain heading for so long, we would be over where the conflict was, and then they could put out some kind of signal light and we'd uh, make our approach. Nighttime was a, a whole different ball game for the flying portion of it. Um, we flew with all our lights off so that uh, Charlie couldn't see our lights. <coughs> Identifying the troops on the ground went through the same process. Um, just get a, a w little bit away from the, your question, which I'll get back to, but uh, the, the nighttime mission was a little more tense. Uh, a lot of times they would use strobe lights, but they would put the strobe light in a helmet on the ground uh, so that the bad guys couldn't see the flash from uh, the horizon's uh, viewpoint. And we would fly over it. We have it, and it would be gone, so we knew that it was in something, so we'd circle around till we found it. And at nighttime, we pretty much had to set up a standard, you know, like a five degree approach in there. And at the last minute, uh, at least of where I was, we were flying at sea level, so we knew the ground was 100 feet. Trees might be another 100 feet. So about 200 feet, we'd turn the lights on. If everything looked good, we'd turn them back off and continue down. If there was enough moonlight, we'd land without them, but uh, a lot of times we'd have to turn them on, which really made us stick out. Sometimes we'd uh, see the light fly over and lose it come back around, find it, okay, start in on the approach, and the last minute turn the lights on and here is a hooch or a Vietnamese house. The uh, soldier standing inside in the window with the light. <laughs> and I don't know where he expected us to land, but uh, sometimes we'd have to go around and come back. But uh, the, th the things that were hardest to take, uh, of course, in all wars, there's uh, civilians that get wounded. Uh, probably the uh, children that uh, casualties of war uh, like I said, we medevaced our own soldiers, the, the Arvin, Arvin soldiers. We medevaced uh, VC that were wounded that were being taken back to be uh, POWs, and of course civilians. And uh, seeing mothers with their wounded children was uh, that was tough. Um, and then our own uh, crew members. Uh, one story that sticks out: this young uh, medic speci specialist, this was rank, and I believe his name was Mike Johnson. And I say a young man because he probably was 19 when I was 21. <clears throat> and as a CW2, they called us chief, which made you feel older anyway. The oldest man in our unit was 32, a medic. And uh, anyway, uh, normally we just flew a crew of four, and we didn't carry any weapons other than our personal weapons in case we had to be on the ground and defend ourselves. But occasionally we would take one of our crew members for a little extra pay and call him a patient protector. We'd put him in one of the seats back along the hell hole as we called it and of course we had the door shut and the windows were all in we really didn't need the wind whipping around inside while the medics were trying to work on the, the wounded and uh, so when we'd land uh, they would then have their M16 uh, ready to help defend the aircraft per se um, and then they'd get a little extra pay for this and it was one mission fortunately just across the river from Dong Tam in an area that none of us like to go into um, we went in in the tall elephant grass, stuff six to ten feet. It waves around like water when the rotor wash hits it. And <clears throat> we went into an LZ and uh, the smoke had dissipated. And, and I'm calling for the guys to pop more smoke. And instead I see an M16 come up out of the grass and then back in. They were just saying, we're here, we don't want to pop more smoke. And we shortly found out why as we were loading, they started uh, firing at us. And as I was taking off, pulling up and around to get away from them, uh, around came through the uh, door and somehow struck uh, uh, Mike uh, right between where the chicken plates came together. They wore him in a vest. 
and there was just enough room there for this AK round to go through there and it lodged in his aorta. Had we been more than just minutes from the hospital, he probably would have died right there, but uh, fortunately <coughs> we were able to get him back, but the, the curdling, blood curdling scream that came out of him uh, just was uh, uh, nightmarish. And I, I don't dream about these things. I feel proud about the mission I had. Uh, I never had to uh, shoot anybody, which was uh, good, uh, and I saved lives and uh, tried to save a lot of other lives. So it, it was disturbing. That night uh, I probably wept like a baby over the fact that he had gotten wounded and uh, of course he ended up leaving country after surgery and whatnot. But, uh, and there were other pilots that got hit. Fortunately I never did, <clears throat> but I've had my other pilots and other crew members wounded. So that's disturbing. Now you were a specifically a medevac. Mm -hmm. Okay, now did you have machine gunners on board? Nope, nothing. Okay, so we were... leads me into a thought of some of the other gunships, I mean, they were transported in the medevac units. I mean, I've, I've had stories of them going in, mm -hmm. the gunners, the full combat ships, mm -hmm. and they had to take wounded out. So, mm -hmm. I mean, is that, was that typical? I mean... It was not uncommon that in the um, large operations where you had several lift companies accompanied by gunships or gunships working with a company once, it, once it's on the ground, two in an emergency situation to take wounded out. And there were numerous occasions where if there was a big operation going on with the 9th Infantry Division that we would see what we refer to as slicks. These were the guys that carried troops. Now they did have machine guns mounted on the side or at least hanging from a bungee cord uh, for their own protection. Um, and then of course the gunships, the uh, old Charlie and Mike wide body gunships and then they came uh, later the Cobras which were the narrow ones. I personally know of a couple Cobra pilots that landed, kicked out their ammo bays and put wounded soldiers into those bays and flew them back at least to a fire base to get them out of the combat area. But I've seen them land at the med pad there in Dong Tam uh, on several occasions. So yes, uh, we didn't have any weapons externally to the aircraft, like I said, just our own personal weapons. And uh, we would use gunships anytime they were available, but we didn't wait or you know, uh, hold up any mission waiting on cover. So. But see, that's amazing to me. I mean, you're going into an LZ, mm -hmm. a hot LZ. I yep. mean, who's providing covering fire? Uh, nobody, <laughs> in some cases. We would fly past downed um, helicopter, slick helicopters that had been shot down in the insertion phase of the operation, um, right up closer to where they were in the firefight. Uh, a lot of times we would not be shot at while we were on the ground. Maybe some of the uh, VC understood the Red Cross. Don't know. Uh, a lot of times they would shoot at us on the ground, other times they'd wait till we'd just lift off. They knew right at that moment we were at our slowest and most vulnerable. And other times they'd wait to see if we came back out in their direction and shoot at us. So, Well, did any of the radio transmissions that you heard on that little trailer on the website, did that jar anything or, oh, or sure. reminiscent of maybe a situation? <laughs> yeah. And that leads me into the question of what type of communications and who were you talking to going into an LZ? Sure. Uh, yes, the trailer did. It, it stirred... Uh, several memories. <clears throat> the most vivid one, I'm sure most of us have seen the movie Apocalypse, where they show the night scene with the, the uh, star clusters that light up the sky and the, the uh, tracers going. <clears throat> there are several night operations where we had Spooky, the C-47, with the mini guns that just look like a hose of tracers coming out. Uh, also a, uh, probably a slick up higher dropping flares to light up the whole area. And we would literally stand off <clears throat> and watch the troops and the lift ships come in and the gunships accompanying them. Uh, it just looked like a movie scene. And then we were monitoring as many tactical uh, frequencies, at frequencies as we could. We had three radios, uh, an FM for the ground troops, UHF and VHF radios for air traffic and air to air. It was not uncommon to have all three radios going at once. And you got pretty good at picking out the person you were talking to. The person on the ground normally was uh, a soldier with an FM radio on his back, a whip antenna and a microphone or a handheld, it looked more like a telephone type of, type of thing. Uh, he was referred to, a uh, call sign might be Red 6 Alpha, in other words he was the platoon leader, uh, radio operator. So his call sign was 6 Alpha, the platoon leader was his 6 and the pecking order that went down from there. So normally it was the 6 Alpha that we talked to unless he was shot himself, and then we might talk to the actual platoon leader or company leader or whatever that uh, would give us the tactical situation, what he thought we had for uh, 
wounded to take out. Besides landing, sometimes we had um, hoist missions. Uh, these were uh, not uh, much fun either. We would literally have to come to however tall the trees were, 100 feet, 150 feet, depending where we were, hover day or night. And uh, this uh, arm on the uh, hoist would go out with a forest penetrator seat. Uh, you've seen them on the current Coast Guard things. This uh, heavy 60-pound uh, seat on a cable would go down to the ground. They'd flop the seats out. Normally, they only put one wounded soldier on at a time. We'd reel him up, pull him in, put him in one of the seats. The medic and the crew chief would do this. Some of them got very good at it, <clears throat> but we were still sitting there. It's a 57-foot long green giant at nighttime with lights on because we had to hold it still, so we had to have both searchlight and spotlight out to give us something to hold the helicopter still with while they went down through the trees with the, the hoist. Sometimes we'd send the medic down on the hoist to help out and then he'd be the last one to come up. And getting out of there, since you're already at a hover at 100 to 150 feet, you just didn't lay it over and go. It was a very slow process, almost like a normal takeoff with not much power left after you loaded it up uh, to get out of wherever you were at. So those were exciting times <laughs> as well. Obviously the adrenaline's flowing. I mean, you're going yeah. into a, an LZ. Do you know if it's hot at the time? I mean. I, mean, I, I still, in my, in my mind, it seemed like you're sitting down, mm -hmm. going into a hot LZ with a with an arm. Medivac nope. Unit. Yep. I mean, were we you, were. are you a religious man? I mean, I am. How about back then? Were you praying? Uh, several times, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I probably, uh, I've always been a Christian mm -hmm. uh, of the Protestant denomination, mm -hmm. uh, and I did uh, talk to God several times, and uh, came out both times, and I am, am certainly a uh, practicing Christian now. And uh, I, what's the old phrase? There, there are no atheists in foxholes. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, sure, we all did. But uh, yes, we were unarmed. Uh, a lot of times we went into hot LZs knowing it was hot. The easiest thing to do was just presume it was hot, whether they were in contact or not. The one time that uh, I crashed due to mechanical failure, uh, we went in after uh, one member of a LERP team, long range patrol that had a high temperature, most likely malaria, running 105. That was the go get him temperature. Uh, on the way out, we heard a metallic bang at right after taking off. And this was in August of 68, so I'd only been there two months. And uh, we kind of all look around to see what the noise was. And we assumed it was an M16. One of the crew members had dropped and fell on the floor. We continued out to the LZ, went through the normal uh, calls. I was flying at the time. And for whatever reason, the aircraft commander, and I remember his first name, Gary, but I can't recall his second name. I did end up taking his call sign while I was in that company. It was dust off 1-4. He decided to make the approach into the LZ. And again, <coughs> my second month in country, he was showing me how we do these things. And he uh, dove the helicopter down, spiraled a little bit, and leveled off me at a long run, zigzagging or S-turning to dissipate speed. And at the last minute, threw it up on its side to really come to a stop. And then normally from that position of the aircraft somewhat up on its side, we'd level it and just let it down and pull the pitch to cushion the landing. Well, just as we put it into that final flare, the, it turned out that the drive shaft along the tail boom, there are bearings every four and a half feet. One of those had failed, but long as there was no stress, it was continuing to run to drive the tail, tail rotor. Well, the stress of the flare and all caused it to fail, the torsion and all that. And once you lose control of the tail rotor, the helicopter, you're basically along for the ride, especially at a hover. <clears throat> so uh, at that point, uh, immediately, the uh, helicopter nose dipped and hit on the nose and skid of my side, right front. The tail boom uh, broke and uh, hinged itself off. Uh, the aircraft came up off the ground. I know Gary was doing all he could to keep it uh, somewhat under control, at least level. And we started spinning around, and I cannot tell you how many times, because the rotor is going one way, the body is going the other. And at some point, uh, we went up and over, upside down, crashed. I remember the engine screaming, so the engine uh, didn't get shut off. Excuse me. And I can remember just screaming at the crew chief, who I saw. We're all hanging upside down in our seats, the two pilots. Screaming at get me out of this thing before it burns. And uh, he reached in through where the uh, front windshield used to be, popped my seat belt, I fell on my head and rolled out. Well, <clears throat> the slurp team has now come out of the woods and with their jaws on their chest, <laughs> thank you for the, the rescue here. 
and uh, as we were counting noses, we were all out of the aircraft. Nobody hurt, uh, fortunately, and we were telling them to shoot the radios. We didn't want the bad guys to get our radios. And just about that time, we started taking fire from the far end of the LZ from AK rounds, and you could see where they were shooting from. So uh, there were five uh, LERP team members. They had three Tiger Scouts. These are Vietnamese Viet Cong that come over and uh, work for our side, or Chu Hoi, as we used to call them. <coughs> and uh, so we all dove into the uh, wood line there, and we ended up in a firefight for about 45 minutes before the gunships could get there. They eventually drove this... Uh, bunch of VC off that had been basically chasing these guys all morning. But see, they failed to tell us that when we uh, went into the LZ that they had been in and out of contact all day. So we went in kind of nonchalant for uh, expecting just to pick up a guy with a temperature and get out. So eventually our standby ship came in, got us out after the gunships drove them off. And there is a little bit of humorous part to this. I was telling you about the oldest guy in the unit, a medic, 32. His name was Waterman. I forget his first name. He was from the south and talked with a very distinctive southern accent. Uh, as we're jumping on the medevac ship with the guy with the temperature to get out of there, the crew chief is telling, well, first off, I said, where is Waterman? And we called him Watermelon. And the crew chief taps me and says, he's down at the wreck, sir. Looks like he's getting his med bag. And so we'd already taken off, so I had to tap the pilot on his shoulder and tell him, ask me to go back in and tell him anything. Go back in to pick up Watermelon. Of course, we're all in the same unit, so around we went. The gunships come in and start blazing uh, up the wood lines for us. And, uh, <coughs> Waterman was built somewhat like a watermelon. He wasn't slim and trim by any means, slow talker. And while we're going back around, uh, the crew chief was telling me that Waterman was not even on the helicopter when we crashed upside down. It, when the first hit, he jumped out and just low crawled basically to the wood line. So I'm really upset at this point because he could have been cut in half by the rotor blades. And I'm really upset that we have to go back into this hot LZ to pick him up. So uh, when he comes over, to the aircraft, throws his med kit on and gets on board. I just snatch him up by the front of his shirt and I'm shaking him. And I'm sure I'm not talking very nice at that point, but I was really mad shaking him. And I basically asked him, why did you jump off the helicopter? You could have been killed. And he kind of pulled back and looked at me for a moment in a very slow southern drawl said, well, sir, I've been through about 3,000 landings now. I could tell that weren't going to be a good one. So <laughs> that kind of broke the tension. Uh, and uh, so we all hugged and made up and, and went back. That, that very day, that night, maybe uh, nine hours later, after seeing the flight surgeon to make sure we were all okay, uh, they brought us a standby, a replacement aircraft, and we went out on a hoist mission that night, and it was one of those over the 100-foot trees, a very quiet mission. Uh, we were all very tense at that point, having crashed once already that day. But uh, I suppose I, I received the only injury from that, and I had a stiff neck the next day from falling on my head. But... Uh, so in combat, I suppose, today, as well as uh, however far back we go, going, you, you find humor where you can to lighten up the tensions and uh, whatnot. So. How many ships would fly out on a mission? Just one? Or? Just one. We were always single ship. Uh, we may have a backup ship or a backup ship and, and crew, in which case we did there at Tanan. We were in support of the 101st Airborne up there um, in Fanthiette. And uh, fortunately, or we'd have been infantrymen for quite a while, but always single ship, and we could have several ships out working different areas. Was there a situation where they were more wounded than you can take, and you're mm -hmm. piling them on? It's just like, you know, you say go, go, go. I mean, what what point do you leave others there, and you know you can't get them out? Or I mean, mm -hmm. did you encounter situations? Absolutely, like that? yes. <clears throat> um, two situations uh, which are common to to your question. In case of the uh, American troops, they were bigger than the Arvins. Uh, just they were just bigger, <laughs> weighed more. Uh, we could carry three litters and then two ambulatory on each side. So we've got seven, and then the four of us. That's basically eleven on board the aircraft. Pretty much brought the UH-1 H Huey to its max gross. I'm sure on occasion we have flown it under combat situations over max gross. I knew we flew it faster than the Red Line, especially with head injuries and stuff. Um, Yes, if there were more than we could carry, we'd, uh, time permitting, ask the, the commander on the ground to prioritize. It's the most serious first. We'd be back as quick as we could. If there were slicks in the area, they might come in and take out some of the ambulatory. Um, the, the field medics, the medics on the ground were fantastic. Uh, they did some amazing things too. So a lot of the boys that were injured 
certainly owe their lives to their first first aid and then our medics as we flew. So we'd, we'd hustle in, drop them off, turn right back around. We've worked, uh, the crews have worked a unit all day long <coughs> uh, down to where there's just two guys left in a bomb crater. Um, and, uh, of course, we didn't take them out. They, they stayed there, and I guess their unit re-supported them or whatever. Uh, I used to, uh, one of my mentors was an ex-Green Beret infantryman uh, turned pilot. And he used to carry extra bandoliers of M16 rounds, and he would throw them out the window to the guys. A lot of times they'd hold their weapon up, I'm out of ammo. I picked up that practice. It was kind of a nice thing to do. And uh, in those, those kind of cases, we'd throw the ammunition out to them so they'd at least have more ammo. Uh, so, and uh, the one situation I remember carrying more than that was a, um, the uh, Viet Cong had mortared a Arvin Battalion meeting and had wounded... Uh, 30 plus people, so they called us. We weren't that far from the uh, Mito, where the uh, Vietnamese hospital was, where we'd take uh, any of the Arvins. But when we got there, um, there was more wounded than uh, obviously we could take in one load, but they're smaller people, so we could almost put two on a litter. And of course, uh, they didn't have the same supplies we did, so they didn't have our kind of litter. And they would take doors off of hooches and use those. And, uh, of course, they didn't fit in our helicopter, so they'd slide them on there, and we were unable to shut the door. So we'd have to end up flying with the door open. And uh, the one load I remember uh, the most was I had, we counted them, 26 people on board, four of us and 22 Arvins, some of them on these doors. We couldn't shut the, the doors. And, uh, of course, the bleeding and stuff with the doors open, it gets sloshed by the rotor wash all around. and. Uh, uh, there's almost all we could do to keep from gagging with the blood flying all around. <clears throat> but uh, so we took them all in. The aircraft was uh, just about out of CG or center of gravity. I, I did the flying and uh, I had the stick, the cyclic back, just about as far as it would go. And not only could only make 50 knots without feeling like I was going to lose the aircraft. So, uh, you know, we extend ourselves in combat. Uh, wouldn't do that today by any means, but. Uh, so there were situations like that, yeah. So, what are your thoughts, Art, about the wounded that you met back out today? I mean, do you have thoughts about these guys, where they're at, or mm -hmm. memories about about these men that you you helped get out of there? I mean, what are your thoughts today about this whole thing? I mean, well, my my first thought about my tour in Vietnam is I'm proud of my service. I'd do it again if uh, if called. Maybe a little too old for it, but uh, the spirit is there. Uh, I'm certainly proud of each one of those individuals that uh, gave part of his body or was wounded for his country and our flag. Um, I donate to all the uh, Vietnam veterans, uh, memorials, uh, paralyzed vets, uh, hospitalized vets, and those type of things. It's a monetary thing. It, uh, <coughs> uh, certainly uh, anytime we see a, a vet on the street, uh, we thank him for serving his country. Welcome him home. Tell, tell me about the homecoming that you received or didn't receive in Vietnam. Yeah, it's very quiet. Um, we flew back, actually we flew both ways on a contracted 707. I forget the airline it was contracting at the time, but uh, we arrived back in Travis Air Force Base to no fanfare. Uh, we were in our khaki uniforms, got off the airplane, went to meet our respective spouses, yeah, got in the car. Went to the hotel, changed clothes, and hit the road for wherever you were headed. No fanfare. Um, I wasn't on the street in any uniforms afterwards, uh, other than my military assignments. And by then, it was uh, I didn't have the occasion to have anybody spit on me or yell at me. <clears throat> I was a little nervous for a while. Anytime around the Fourth of July, when firecrackers would go off, I'd find myself ducking. Uh, uh, incoming uh, rounds of uh, artillery or rockets uh, was always an exciting thing when you're laying in your bunk at night or <clears throat> down at the club and things like that. And they had uh, bunkers that were built and you'd uh, run for the bunker and try to get in before the rounds hit you. But yeah, it took a while to get over that, that noise. Well, what about any sights and sounds today that were triggered? I mean, mm -hmm. helicopters, I mean, are there things today that you're looking up to the skies? What's mm -hmm. I mean, the last helicopter I flew uh, when I retired out of the Alaska Guard in 1991 was a Black Hawk. The one and only time I flew it at the time, I was the battalion commander of the aviation unit up there. And as such, I could go out and fly the aircraft, although I wasn't qualified in it. 
<coughs> with one of our instructor pilots, and I was uh, amazed at uh, how far the helicopter had come from the, the Huey, which is basically a seat of your pants, for all practical purposes, uh, type of flying where the uh, Black Hawk had augmented stabilization and you didn't really need to use your feet to keep the thing lined up. Uh, when I look up, you can tell the sound of a Huey. The Huey has its own sound, the most unique uh, sound of any helicopter. Anybody that's ever flown it or been around them on the ground can recognize that sound. And uh, where I live, they do use some Huey helicopters uh, for uh, ag spraying and whatnot. And uh, when I hear it, uh, I try to figure out where it is from my direction. It, it does stir the old warrior spirit in me uh, to look up and find it. And most of us that flew the Huey, we say, uh, when they take the last Black Hawk or one of these newer fancy helicopters to the boneyard, say at Davis Motham Air Force Base, they'll ferry the crew back to the airport in a Huey. It'll be around for a long time. It's a good, uh, good basic helicopter. Can you tell me briefly about any drug usage in Vietnam? You hear a lot of stories. I mean, yeah, you do hear stories. Uh, I must have been naive or just unknowledgeable. I actually didn't see any, uh, and I think marijuana was the most prevalent. I guess in the infantry units where the guys were out sloshing in the boonies all the time that it was more prevalent. Within the aviation outfit, uh, uh, I, I didn't see it and I, and I was very ignorant of it. Uh, of course, alcohol was there and uh, we used that to calm our nerves or just to relax and whatever. So that was very prevalent at the time. But um, yeah, I hear the stories too and um, uh, you know, it's unfortunate. but. Uh, is there anything else? I mean, I mean, I, I can only imagine what you saw and experienced, mm -hmm. but any other situations before down here as far as the, the wounded? I mean, did, were you always looking over your shoulder in the back of the ship as they're cutting in and mm -hmm. kind of wondering what's going on, what kind of wounds? I mean, absolutely. What, what else do you remember that you can share with me about the wounded getting on board, even getting off the aircraft? Sure. <coughs> uh, there was almost a paternal feeling. Once they were on board, they were ours. Um, even if uh, I was flying or uh, normally the guy that made the approach and, and the takeoff out of the LZ, whether it was hot or not, after we got airborne just to relax a little bit, you let the other guy fly en route back to the hospital. And that was an opportunity to turn around and talk to the medic and the crew chief who were working on the wounded, uh, whatever was needed to go on. Uh, in some cases there was urgency in their voice, uh, in which case we would push the helicopter uh, past its red line to get them there especially head wounds, and <clears throat> in those particular cases, we'd have to stay low so the pressure change wouldn't uh, cause more swelling. But uh, yes, always talking, always looking, uh, trying to assess so that we could assist the hospital triage in any way we could with information about what wound was coming in, uh, sucking chest wounds, you know, uh, legs and arms missing, head wounds, those kind of things, that, uh, critical information that would help them help these guys once they got there. And, and we, of course, watched as they uh, were taken off the helicopter. Uh, and then back we'd go for another load or wait for another mission and stuff. And, so and what's, what's going on in the, in the ship when you're going back with the wounded? Is there screaming, crying? Is mm. just talk, quiet? I mean, who's comforting <coughs> these patients? I mean. uh, each other, themselves, <laughs> actually were doing a lot of comforting. One, they were on the way out of the LZ, the hot LZ. Those that were sitting and, and slightly wounded uh, would be talking as much as they could to uh, their fellow uh, soldiers. Those that were really wounded and or in shock, uh, there wasn't much you could do from them other than uh, attend to their wounds. Uh, certainly the medic and crew chief were talking to them, telling them, you know, hang in there, you know, you'll be there in a few minutes, you're going to be okay, whatever uh, type of uh, message that would help them calm down. And uh, yes, sure, there was screaming, um, crying, uh, every emotion you can think of in combat. Uh, a lot of times it was just crying from the relief of, uh, you know, I'm not being shot at right now and uh, I'm on my way out regardless of, you know, what's, what's missing or wounded. Um, so. Well, you mentioned, <coughs> did you mention in your email that you, wounded would be taken aboard and then they would, incoming rounds would, mm -hmm. would you mentioned one incident that happened a lot, I mean. Too many times, yeah. certainly, sure. Uh, one of the feelings that they certainly had was relief uh, as we'd lift up out of the LZ. They were leaving the LZ, as I said, uh, whether they were wounded or, or missing something. Uh, and so their emotions were, you know, draining, they were relaxing, and then if we'd start taking fire, 
uh, they're sitting in the main body of the aircraft and that's the easiest part to hit and uh, as the rounds would come in um, yeah they would get re-wounded and uh, scream appropriately to the uh, wherever they were hit um, that that was uh, terribly sad uh, medic and, the, and the, the crew chief were back there of course they had the armor plates on uh, not in all cases as I mentioned earlier with uh, Mike Johnson, I believe his name was, uh, took the round right between the two plates. So, uh, yeah, that, that was sad for them to get re-wounded when they thought they were on the ride out and not have to worry anymore. So at least till they got fixed up and went back out. But, uh, yeah. And these are AK-47s? The AK-47, the basic uh, worldwide supplied communist uh, assault weapon. You see it all the time on TV nowadays with the, in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. Did you mention something in your email about the sound? You'll never forget the oh, sound. Oh, sure. The yeah, there's there's a certain, and I don't even think I can duplicate it with uh, my voice, but it's a thwack kind of sound, if you will, as the AK round punches through the skin. And the skin of the Huey is just aluminum, uh, and uh, it, it definitely has a distinct sound, as does the Huey itself. Um, and, of course, on top of all the screaming that might be going on or the crying or or whatever, the yelling of uh, the medic and crew chief to each other. Um, they basically, a lot of times, couldn't be worried about pushing the button to use the intercom, so they would yell back and forth. And you add the noise of the Huey to it, and it's on. It, it was very uh, ratchet back there. Did you get chaotic at times, or was it or pretty organized? Though? Chaotic if one of the patients would get uh, frantic or start thrashing about back there on the litter and there were other patients there we were trying to protect who several times they'd take both of them to hold him down while one of them tried to get whatever first aid was necessary yeah and then uh, <clears throat> of course after the day's work or if we didn't have any more missions right away there was a cleaning of the helicopter which was most unpleasant the floor of it would be covered with mud and blood and after a while it would certainly start to pick up a distinct odor of its own uh, burn patients uh, from uh, white phosphorus, Willie Pete. Uh, stuff is just uh, um, absolutely horrendous. It gets on your skin, and as long as there's air, it will burn and burn right through. So <clears throat> basically the first aid thing is cover it in mud, keep the air away from it. But the, the And then the smell of burned flesh is, uh, I don't think I'll ever be cremated. I know I won't smell it, <laughs> but I don't think I could uh, even entertain the thought. Uh, yeah. So. Did, or did patients die in route? Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, their, their chance of surviving in the Vietnam War was ten times better than that of the Korean War, where we first started really using helicopters for medevac. Uh, in some instances, they were, from the time of being wounded to the time, at least our medic getting to them, less than 15 minutes, depending on how far out they were. Other times it would be longer. and and some certainly died uh, waiting for us, and others died on the way back to the hospital. And it's just, there are some wounds that uh, there's just no, no stopping the uh, effect. So, yeah, that was sad. Is there any pride among you uh, as far as today and being around maybe helicopter, helic hospital, medevacs? I mean, have you ever, have you ever been in situations? Or <coughs> I, I was around that a little bit when I worked at a hospital, and mm -hmm. uh, I got to go on two medical flights, and sure. gave me a little tiny sliver of an idea of what it could have been like in Vietnam. But is there pride about your work, and you know, seeing that today in operation, and mm -hmm. looking at that, and going, yeah, I did that. I was a pioneer, or whatever. Sure, absolutely, uh, great pride in the job we did. Uh, all of our our crew members, I think. So feel that pride. We, we belong to different organizations, the dust-off organization, Vietnam helicopter pilots, the crew chiefs and medics all have their sub-organizations, uh, annual meetings of that type. But personally, yes, absolutely. Uh, when I see today's young men and women, I get choked up and, and uh, like I am now. Uh, I am so proud. So proud that we have young men and women that step up in the time of need uh, to do this type of job. Uh, again, it's a single ship uh, and no weapon. Uh, you're going out there knowing that uh, your chances of getting shot at, hit, and wounded are uh, as good as the guy you're going out to rescue. And uh, the fact that we still have brave young men and women that do this job, uh, it's a lot of pride in them. And then uh, gives me a good feeling for the job that uh, we all did. So, sure, absolutely. Uh, yeah. 
And you're talking about the civilian sector now, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, military and civilian. Okay. We still have dust off today. Sure. Uh, they're using the Black Hawk. Uh, they have longer range, faster helicopter. Uh, but they still have the same thin skin. <laughs> and uh, certainly for, oh yes, uh, watching our own uh, medevac or air vac, as they call themselves in some cases, civilian. Uh, sure, it, uh, when I see them on the road uh, landing out there, it, it stirs, uh, you know, the old spirit and the memories. And a lot of them are guys, you know, just like me that did the job in Vietnam. Of course, a lot of them are getting too old for that now, but uh, certainly for many years it was uh, Vietnam vets that were medevac pilots that were flying that type of mission. In fact, the man I was, the hospital I was referring to, the man in Vietnam, and mm -hmm. I kind of wonder <coughs> now, but... Um, let me ask you a question. I asked all the World War II veterans this mm. at the end of my interviews, but uh, <coughs> being a Vietnam veteran mm -hmm. and being an American citizen, what does freedom mean to you, Art? Well, uh, those of us that served and uh, watched our fellow soldiers die for what they believe in, uh, we first off, we know freedom is not free. Uh, it has a great, great uh, expense in that in our blood and bodies of our brave young men and women. Uh, knowing that, the fact that uh, we are allowed to live in this country the way we do, uh, due to all these brave young men and women, uh, makes me very proud and happy to have participated in service and providing that freedom just to live where we do under uh, the laws and rules that we do. Uh, what does the American flag mean and represent to you? Oh, it stirs a lot of emotion. Uh, <clears throat> having been uh, in combat, you see the enemy's flag. Of course, we would take them as souvenirs if we could. Sometimes the, the ground unit got most of them, but every once in a while they'd give us one and for a souvenir type thing. But it, it, it just made you, uh, when you see the American flag the, uh, standing up for the Pledge of Allegiance at uh, schools or ballparks or games or whatever, uh, hearing the national anthem and parades when the flag goes by, I stand up. I put my hand over my heart, and uh, I do look around to see who else is. And I, I see some, and most of them, they look like they might have been in the military, or not always, but uh, you can certainly tell those that were in the military. Uh, they stand probably the tallest and the proudest. So, yeah, the American flag is uh, important to us, symbol of uh, who we are and what we do. Yep. Have you given an interview like this before? I think you said you've never really talked. No. Why do you think you've never talked about it before? Uh, no opportunity or just wasn't time? Or I mean, uh, I'm so gracious you're talking to me. Why are you <laughs> talking to me today, Art? Uh, it's time. Yeah, time. Previously, uh, you know, the war stories, and usually just those that had some tinge of humor in them, we would, uh, pilots and soldiers were like, you get a bunch of them together and it's war story time. And uh, n normally the ones that were the most humorous, unless you found a guy that was in that other helicopter covering you, and then you go over the war story uh, about the gunships covering you that were out of ammunition, but they're going to make the run anyway and try to draw fire and those kind of things. Uh, all heroes. And uh, so. Were you ever, in the, I guess, in the company going in on a mission with the gunships, or was it just you apart from <coughs> the gunships? Uh, we would use gunships if they were on station. And if they were on station, they're more than happy to come in and cover us. So we would t tell them basically which direction we'd be coming in and ask them either to set up a racetrack pattern on each side of us. Uh, when I first got in country, we had the old wide-body Cobras, as I like to call them, but the wide-body Hue Hueys, Charlie, and Mike model gunships. They were our speed, and uh, they would get right down next to us, a little bit off so we could maneuver. But they would be right there, and you could see them, and it uh, gave you a little feeling of uh, security <laughs> as you went in in a hot LZ. If they weren't there, we went in there anyway. When the Cobras came in country, uh, they had a little more accurate firepower. And again, if they were on station, they were more than willing to help, and we were more than willing to accept their help. But you didn't see them because they'd have to start their runs a little bit higher and a little further out because their speeds were a bit faster than the other. But that's okay. We knew where they, they were there, and we could see the uh, rocket flashes or the tracer rounds going by and hitting wherever we asked them to uh, put suppressive fire. So, so you yeah. said it's about 3,000 patients you carried in and out? Or? We kept a uh, record of numbers, not certainly by name because that was all done in the hospital, but each sortie, 
uh, we'd mark down on a sheet of paper how many patients we carried out. And in my year, almost to the day, I arrived on the 21st, and I think I stopped flying on the 19th the following July. <clears throat> 1,050 hours of combat time, uh, and then it was 3,000 in, in odd numbers, but it was at least 3,000 patients personally on board the aircraft that I was the aircraft commander. So there was a couple months at the beginning where I was not the aircraft commander that, you know, certainly the load. Uh, the longest I've ever spent in a Huey helicopter doing medevac work was 21 hours. The only reason I got up out of the seat was to uh, relieve myself, stretch, and uh, there was a big, big push with the 9th Division, and uh, we were it. And uh, we just went and went, and they'd bring coffee and sandwiches out to us. We'd drop the patients off, the wounded off, and grab a sandwich and cup of coffee, and out we'd go to, to the hot refuel and then back out to the, where the uh, combat was going on. How many missions was that? Oh, gosh. Hundreds. Yes. <clears throat> hundreds of hundreds. Yeah. Uh, a mission a sortie might last uh, less than an hour. Uh, so certainly. Uh, and those that were more than an hour, uh, certainly under two hours, we didn't have much more fuel than that. So, yeah, probably 900 missions and stuff. Uh, That's amazing. That one, one year, one tour mm -hmm. for you? That was pretty high for, there were other guys that flew higher, but the, th the three guys that uh, arrived in country, together myself and uh, the two other gen gentlemen, uh, Snyder and Romines, uh, basically all came out with almost identical numbers within a 10, 20 of each other. Uh, we were all gung-ho, I guess, and we even had a little, uh, I guess you could call it a game, we called it scarfing. We were all flying out of Long Bend and we had an aircraft standby in Tan An, halfway to Dong Tam, where the other standby was south of Saigon. And if we were airborne and heard a call come in for a medevac to the Tan An radio operator, we would copy all the information down if we weren't doing anything. But we would just be quiet and race out to the site and try to get there before they would. And usually, you'd, I've been scarfed several times by Mr. Romines, and uh, we would make the initial call to the ground unit and tell them, okay, we're coming in, and then all we'd hear a little chuckle over the radio and look down and see him flaring and pulling up to a stop in the NRLZ. So uh, we did what we could to amuse ourselves. Uh, you know, day after day, uh, uh, seeing the trauma of war, it wore on some guys more than others, and uh, although I don't uh, have dreams or nightmares about it, uh, it certainly can choke me up when I think about it and talk about it. So. Do you remember your last sortie before you went home? Was it like, this is your last mission art, you're going home? Mm -hmm. I mean, was it emotional? I mean, The last one wasn't, um, they were pretty nice to us. The, the last week before you put all your stuff in your duffel bag and, and turned in anything that the unit owned before you went back to Saigon to get out, they pretty much put you on hospital, hospital transfers and took away a little bit of the, uh, the threat. But the, uh, the week prior, uh, I, I got shot down, <laughs> so yeah, I, uh, I was getting a little nervous there. I had uh, you know less than a couple weeks to go, and here I was, uh, my second uh, time of having my feet in the rice paddies. Uh, that was the one time we came up out of the LZ and had to come straight up, top the trees, and then go out over the trees away from where the, the uh, uh, ground guys were being shot at at the moment, and we had picked up the Willie Pete, our guys that had gotten. Willie Foster, uh, Willie Pete on him from our own uh, weapons. And uh, it flew right over a machine gun nest. <coughs> Every light on the dashboard, the instrument panel lit up. Uh, although I landed with a little power and the engine left, it was, it was headed south on us. Uh, we touched down in the LZ. I looked out and the patients are already in the wood line. Uh, I was the last one out and uh, ran the whole 100 feet or so to the wood line had my M2 carbine with me, and uh, fortunately there was a CNC command and control slick up overhead with the commander of the unit and all his radio stuff. Uh, they saw us go down and then came in within, oh, I guess maybe three, four minutes, landed. Patients all ran out and got on board, and I was the last one. I was John waning across the, pointing my M2 in the direction that we had come where the uh, machine gun was, and get back on the helicopter and look down and the safety's on. I, I, <laughs> I couldn't have put a round down downrange if I tried at that moment without thinking about it. We, uh, you know, we were not uh, preconditioned to actually uh, get ourselves involved in the actual shooting part of the war. So the weapons were there for our personal use, but uh, like I, said, I never fired around. So. Well, I'm, 
I'm, I'd love to keep going. I'm going to stop sure. now, but I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. Sure. I ask everybody at the end of my interviews if it's okay. Mm -hmm. From where you're sitting, when I tell you, can you give me a salute into the camera? Oh, sure. Okay, Art, right into the camera. All right. There you go. Excellent.